and quite frankly, you are doing one of the most important things right now. You're acting. You're, you're not home watching Oprah. You're out here uh, <laughs> visiting back and forth, and you're doing something. And that's, that's one of the major things that can happen. Now, I, I plagiarized some information off the Internet uh, about, uh, over here there's some papers, two different papers. One, which you get in the next year, how do you keep from it? How do you keep from Christmas beating you in the first place? And then the second one would be, uh, if it has, how do you get past the blahs? There's several ideas that they they bring up. But why why are we talking about? I mean, we just had Christmas, and why are we talking about? How could anybody be unhappy? Okay. Well. I want to use a want to use a kind of bear with me. I want to use a kind of a strange example uh, that kind of wanders off down the down the path. And I know uh, I do analogies a lot, and a lot of the teenagers start looking at the ceiling and, and <laughs> wondering what in the world is he talking about. But I'm going to start by talking about cocaine. Okay, um, cocaine. A physiological thing, I'm going to talk about what cocaine does to the brain. Why would anybody use it? Be because they're down in the dumps and trying to escape, or they're trying to impress their friends. But when a person uses cocaine, it puts so much neurotransmitters into their, into their brain that they have never felt that happy in their entire life. It is a fantastic, I'm not selling cocaine now. <laughs> it is a fantastic, fantastic feeling from what I've been told. Okay, so the people that do that get a little bit more money and they try again. And it's not quite as good. And they try again. And it's not quite as good. And on and on and on it goes. They never experience that mythological, fantastic feeling. All right? Stretch cocaine. Go, go back to Christmas, Thanksgiving, and New Year's. We're little munchkins running around the house. We're one, two years old. They're telling us some fat guy is going to come down the chimney, and they're going to, is going to give them presents, and they're going to be so, so happy. <coughs> And then the first, and then the first rub comes in, but they're saying, "But you better be good. If you're not good, may not happen." So even at two years old, we, we get a little stressor. You know, am I going to be good enough? Am I really going to get the bicycle this year, the chemistry set, the Barbie doll? Is it really going to happen? And we start at, at, as soon as we can actually think, go back as, as far as we can. We start building up in our mind that. This Christmas thing is going to be the most fantastic thing that's ever happened in my life. Kind of like the person seeking their second cocaine trip. This is going to be fantastic. But it doesn't work out that way. Uh, life isn't, life can't be lived in that euphoric state. We, we, we can't be that happy. But we put so much into it. We're going to get the bicycle. We're going to, we're going to get the doll. Uh, after we get into school, we're going to get to be out of school. Uh, if we're working, we're going to get to take off from work as, and go on vacation. And it never turns out quite like we really wanted it to. It's never, this can't be that good. And then, it, it gets even worse because now I've identified uh, a season, uh, a date on the calendar that's going to come around every 365 days. I've identified this season coming up with the potential for happiness. It's going to be so good. But as the years go by, our relationships break up. The children are at the mother's house Christmas Eve and the father's house Christmas Day. There's that chaos. 
we lose people in our lives. As, as we go through life, people move on. And when those things happen anywhere near this time of the year, uh, that's what we remember. And that brings us that brings us down. So we could end up there, there could be 15, 20 people in this room that uh, kind of have the blahs. Or if they didn't have the blahs before I started talking to them, got past it, they were doing okay, and now I'm bringing all the black, and, and now they are they are. <laughs> but. Uh, but uh, what do we do about it? Well, you ladies are doing something about it right now. You're you're out and you're active. You're you're interacting with people, and that's one. The book the handouts are going to tell you similar information to to do about that. But uh, sort of the presentation would be from a, Melissa mentioned that I do cognitive behavioral therapy, which means. We're concentrating on what we think about. What we think about is the solution. So there's a there's a formula that that is that is in place. What I think about happens. It's called the law of self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, famous uh, auto manufacturer Henry Ford once said that you know if you believe you can do it. Well, you know, if you believe you can't do it, you're absolutely right. So we can end up becoming our own worst enemy when we're focused on us. Oh, it's, it's a crummy looking day. Nothing's going to work out today. That's what we get. So in preparation to, to move forward with your lives today, establish goals. Something that you want, because uh, without, without a purpose, we, we don't go anywhere. So be, be, looking for, be looking for, what do I want next? And there always is more. Until we pass over into the next uh, realm, uh, we're supposed to be enjoying and living our lives and accomplishing something else. So. Establishing a goal, obviously, uh, you have to think to do that. Okay. Then you also have to you have to think um, regarding belief systems. I don't think I can do it. I can't do that. Or oh yes, I can do that. Uh, belief system has to be there. If I establish a goal and I believe I can do it, what's it going to do? It's going to destroy the post-holiday blues. If, if I have a positive goal and if I believe I can do it, my mood is going to be happy. Basically like what's in the room today. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be happy. And thus, so what? My mood is going to dictate the next thing I do in this world. Uh, visit with people. Uh, whatever you do after you leave here. My mood, if I leave here in an outgoing positive mood, uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to go do something that's going to be positive, uplifting, and outgoing. And that's basically what the handouts are going to tell you to do. Find something. Don't just help people on Christmas time. People hurt year round. Don't just do that one day of the year. Uh, the mentions in there to send thank you cards for the gifts you get. Volunteer, come to meetings like this. Do something, do something to, to stay active. And if you do, you'll meet your goals. Because uh, we live, uh, God will do 95% of the work. Uh, this, I know that religious groups here of all types of religion, and I may step on toes coming up with some weird spiritual ideas that I have and don't be offended. You can just say he's crazy, he doesn't know, doesn't know anybody. But uh, in, uh, in re 
reading the Bible and going to church and listening to sermons, there's so much talk about whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you're going to receive. Seeking you're going to find. Asking it's going to be given. Not the door will open. And quite frankly, the most outstanding thing that if, if you go back and read it and think about it, happened on the day of Pentecost. Jesus Christ had led his life and was dead, buried, and resurrected. And he walked around for 50 days with his disciples. Now, keep in mind, there's written reports that he raised somebody from the dead that had been dead for days. But he healed blindness, walked on water, uh, cured leprosy, changed water into wine, some pretty outstanding things. And the last thing that the deity said before it left our presence where it could be visibly seen was, I'm going to the Father, and when I go to the Father, you're going to be able to do greater things than I did. And all my life I thought, well, that's a warm and fuzzy thing to talk about on a Sunday afternoon. Who believes that? Well, <coughs> Your whole salvation depends on it. It's, it, it's true. And you look around, well, I still haven't won the lottery. I've been asking about it, I've been asking about it, I still haven't won the lottery. No, I mean, this, this doesn't work. But uh, quite frankly, uh, God is telling us that... Uh, is talking cognitive behavioral therapy because it's not all positive. If we approach God and say, gosh, I'm going to have a miserable day, God doesn't slap us upside the head and say, shake up, what's the matter with you? He just says, okay. I don't know why, but okay. So, our negative thoughts are intensely powerful. They are just like positive prayer when we're asking for happiness and productivity. We, we are playing with dynamite when we think in a negative manner. <coughs> because that's what's going to happen. So that's kind of a scary little activity to think about. But uh, so what can you do about it? Most of our thinking is kind of on autopilot. <coughs> you're listening, you're kind of aware, we're aware of the five senses we see and we hear, and you're tasting your lunch and you're smelling and smelling the room, and the five senses are going, and besides that, our minds are going 100 miles an hour. Um, when's he gonna shut up? <laughs> What's for dessert? What do I have to do after I leave here? Uh, what's going to happen next? Uh, and on and on and on. Our brains are, are going after us all the time. And that information is going into our brain. And our brain is working with it. So when I'm telling my brain I can't play the saxophone, okay? I've got one that's been sitting in my closet for five years. And you're right, I can't play the saxophone. <laughs> and that actually goes back to when I was in the fifth or sixth grade. Some school teacher told me I didn't have any musical ability. And I believed it. I put it in my brain. And I, it feeds me over all these years. Doesn't matter how many, but it's all these years. And I'm not playing the saxophone because of pre-programmed thoughts to the contrary. And every one of us have tons of pre-programmed thoughts that are not good for us. And so, what on earth can we do about it? And this part where it's, um, I know I, I lose the teenagers quite a bit. Uh, if, if anybody's ever talked to anybody 
that has uh, come to see me, uh, they'll, they know what's coming next. Because I'm a firm believer that the solution is meditation. And we have thoughts of Buddhist. He was talking about Jesus a minute ago. And now, what is this medit what is this what is this thing he's talking about, meditation? Well, I'm not talking about it as a overt religious activity. I'm talking about it as a thinking exercise. Just like if we want to to be stronger and be able to pick up more weight, we can go we can go to the gym and we can we can do weights, and we can do the videos, and we can get into shape, and we can physically be stronger. If we want, if we want more control over our brain, we've got to do mental gymnastics. And the hardest thing in the whole wide world for us to do with our brain <laughs> is to think about one thing. I mean, we're thinking about hundred thousand things going on right now. How are we going to focus that down to one thing? <coughs> Pretty hard to do. Not everybody accomplishes it. Uh, I've been trying to practice what I preach and uh, I don't get there. But I but it has been it has been I have seen benefits from it, but it's hard to do. Now we are we are in the computer generation, uh, and on the web on websites you can Google in meditation, and there's tons of information about how you go about it, and everybody's got their own idea about it. But basically, what it amounts to is I'm going to focus on I'm going to do something that focus on one thing, and I'm going to do it over and over and over again until. I zone out. <coughs> and you literally do, if you are successful at it, you literally do zone out. Some people get in a, a dark room and look at a flickering candle. Some people close their eyes and imagine a drop of water hitting the pond and the pond go, the rippling out. Some people buy tapes and listen to um, type sounds. I practice breathing. I get up in the middle of the night, after I had to go to the bathroom, I had to be up anyway, so, and walk down the hall, and I sat on the floor against the wall, put some headphones on to block out any sound that might come, and I close my eyes, and I make the most important thing in the whole wide world the thought that I just breathed in, and I just breathed out. Do that over and over and over and over again. And my brain goes crazy. You need to get back to bed. You better get up and go to work in two hours. You better get some rest. Uh, did you do the notes? Did you know who's coming first tomorrow? Uh, uh, what are you going to do this weekend? And just yak it yak yak yak. But my response is I'm breathing in and I'm breathing out. After five, ten minutes to an hour, Dependent, the brain finally says, I am sick of you, and goes on vacation. And what happens from a medical point of view, you've seen people that have had these electrodes put on their head, they, they do sleep studies here. Mm -hmm. They put these electrodes on their head, and you can see this wiggly line on it. The, there's electrical activity in the brain. Well, there's different wavelengths of, of electrical activity. And there's one for what's going on now. And there's one when we're asleep, and there's a different one if we actually reach what they call this alpha meditated state. It's a real slow wavelength. Now, I want to sell it by telling you it has to be the most wonderful feeling you've ever come upon in your life when you actually do it, when you actually quit thinking, and you're seated there, you get this warmth comes over you like God Almighty is just hugging you. You're warm, relaxed, there's not a care in the world, you're at complete peace with all of life. Everything is fantastic. 
and still not selling drugs, but that's what people chase with marijuana. It, they'll tell you that it does that too. <coughs> but you don't wake up looking for the cops to come arrest you <laughs> if you do the meditation. When you, when you get into that state, if you, if you think about it, imagine that we've got 100 workers in our brain. That 100 workers is responsible for keeping a heart beating, keeping blood flowing through our body, keeping us breathing. It works on our immune system. If we scratch ourselves, it's, it's working to send white blood cells to the area to kill any bacteria that's coming. It helps with our digestive system. And it actually replaces every cell in our body. Uh, I've read that we are a completely different person every seven years, that the cells right there won't be there seven years from now. We completely replace our body every seven years, and it happens because our body is working and replenishing itself. So when we, and when we relaxed, these workers are out doing their job. But when we're stressed out, depressed, discouraged, wondering what we're going to do about it, what we're going to get Uncle Joe for Christmas, or uh, is, who's coming for Christmas, or where are we going for Christmas, or am I going to be alone for Christmas, what am I going to do? Stress causes those workers to have to deal with my stress. And so my body doesn't get addressed. I don't get the immune system that I'm supposed to have. We get the flu in December. We get colds. We get allergies. Our, our, we come up with more illnesses because our body is not taking care of us. Also, our brains are deteriorating. Um, and when we're in this meditative state, our brains are actually being repaired, and that's the whole purpose of this long tirade about meditation. Uh, when your brain is functioning absolutely perfect, you are able to think about what you're thinking about anytime you want to. And you don't drift off so often into this zoning out where your brain is just duck, 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 duck. and you don't even have, you're depressed, discouraged, or angry, or upset. You don't even have any idea why. When your brain, when you fix the front part of your brain, so that you know what you're thinking about. And the thought comes through your head, oh, I hate it, Christmas is coming again. You can go, whoa, no, 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 no. We don't have to go there. Uh, this is going to be a wonderful season. It's going to be great. Or if you get up like I did and, and it's raining, I can't walk the dog. And, oh, man, why does it have to be raining? I went, whoa, 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 whoa. For six months, I stood out on my back porch and watched the, the grass <laughs> burn to a crisp. And here I am griping because there's some moisture in the ground. Get it, get my act together, and get on with it here. So, if I can be, utilize meditation and/or other activities, like staying focused and doing things, and keep up with what I'm thinking, uh, I'm going to beat the holiday blues. Now, that's got to confuse everybody. Anybody got any questions? Any brave souls? Uh, Yes, ma'am. Can meditation help you with insomnia? Yes, yes. Um, in fact, I've experienced uh, having kind of a troubled nights, and actually finally realized, why don't I just get up and meditate? I'm not sleeping anyway. Mm -hmm. And I go back later and sleep like a baby. So yes, it, 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 it helps. It quietens the mind. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, yes, because post-traumatic stress disorder is brought about by that panic button going off. Every time I think about the upsetting event, it's like I'm living in it again. And my mind is in complete turmoil, and that drains me. So if I can quiet my mind, uh, I develop strength strength of the front part of my brain so that as a trigger comes from a post-traumatic stress uh, activity, something ha something triggers. I see somebody that reminds me of something. Uh, I can go, whoa, no, it's a good day. That's not the person. And I can sometimes avoid 
getting into the anxiety attack to begin with. But also can, I can also put myself into uh, a more effective mental status where, if need be, I can discuss the situation. Don't have to. Don't have to. You, you don't have to discuss the horrible things that happen in life. Sometimes it, sometimes it helps. The, the important factor is getting past it. Uh, moving on. Today, just for today, everything is fantastic. Yes, ma'am. something to gripe about. Uh, you, we have power, we have power over other people to a certain degree. We can't say, okay, you're going to have to think positive, you're going to have to think positive now. Because you dig in your feet and say, I'll, I'll do what I please. You're not going to tell me what to do. But I can, I can change my behavior and my thinking. I can think, you know, I bet you're thinking positive right now. I bet you're thinking positive. And the affect, our personality bleeds over. And if we are positive, and if we we respond in a positive manner, and if also if we listen for the the people that are upset, to instead of going saying there they go again, try to try to figure out what are they griping about? What what what's upsetting them? And sometimes uh, we can provide a soft answer. We can, we can sometimes do something. We do have power over other people. That's that's a major, that's a major point in couples counseling. Couples come in, uh, both of them are saying, "You need to fix that other person." <laughs> my 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 husband is is the problem. No, my, that nagging wife is the problem. And and they're all focused on all focused on. Uh, on do something for the other person, but uh, they leave counseling. Sometimes they get up, walk out in the middle of the time, and say, "I, I, I, don't, I don't want anything to do with this." But they leave uh, if they listen. But they leave understanding I've got power. I can do what I want to do. I can think what I want to think. I can act like I want to act. I can respond in appropriate manners. I don't have to be offended if somebody's upset with me. I can just, if I've got control over my thinking and somebody cusses me out, I can, I can think, oh, they must be having a difficult day, <laughs> as opposed to, you get out of my face, type thing. I, I have power over other people by maintaining my own, my own thinking process and looking for ways to interact with people. Now, we do that, we do that all the time. Police officer pulls you over. You don't roll the window down and cuss him out. Oh yes, sir. What can I do, sir? You know. Uh, you go through the Walmart line, and, uh, and the, the poor lady uh, running the groceries up is upset and going kind of slow. You don't go. Hey, you need to hurry up now. I got to get out of here. <laughs> oh, you'll still be there. You'll still be at Walmart. No, you go. I'm sorry, you're going through this trouble, ma'am. Can I help in some way? Now, we look for, we, how can we help? And that, that's, I didn't want to drive your question into the ground, but that, that's, a, that's a neat one because we do have power over other people. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I've always, I've been, it's very good for you to meditate, and I always wondered how, and I've never had a clue until you just told us how to do it. And uh, I was trying, and I, my mind would go off on something else. And oh, yes. I experience that happens. It's a difficult thing to do. And you, you have to just keep struggling with it and struggling with it and struggling with it. And learn different techniques, things that might work for you. But just don't give up. You know, I don't remember
remember, I'm not a big enough Bible scholar to remember the, where it is, but there's a place in the Bible where God says, why don't you just shut up and listen to me? I'm sick of your prayers. I'm, give me this, give me that, give me this. I don't know where that is, but there's a place that I've, I've used, I've changed the wording, but God is saying, listen, listen. And that's what happens when you meditate. That is the spiritual factor. God Almighty and the Holy Spirit is interacting with our soul. That's why we still feel this warmth and, and feel so good. And we get ideas. Now, it's not like Charlton Heston talking through the burning bush. You know, nothing like that. But we get ideas. And you've experienced ideas. You've experienced where you've had an idea that felt good in your heart. And it's really the right thing to do. And you've experienced ideas, yakety yak in your brain, that you knew, ah, I don't need to be messing with this. But messages from God are going to feel good in your heart. And you're going to know it's the thing for you to do. You're going to know it's the right path for you to take. 